Good evening, everybody. I'm Councillor Lynn Doherty, the leader of West Berkshire Council. Welcome to today's executive meeting. Now, before we get started, I'd just like to mark this occasion. Um, it's actually our Chief Executive, Executive Officer, Nick Carter's last executive. Now, while we spoke about him last week at full council, so I don't intend to embarrass him too much this evening, I just wanted to mark the occasion and say thank you, Nick. Thank you on behalf of all of the administration. As an executive, you've seen us through many years and it's been appreciated by every single one of us. So we weren't going to let you off lightly. I've told you this many times, but thank you, Nick, for all that you've done for us. Following, um, before I start on everything else, I'd just like to explain the ben um, for the benefit of members of the public who may be watching that today's meeting is being held in a hybrid format. Following the expiry of the emergency coronavirus regulations that permitted remote meetings, all of the council's public meetings must now take place in person at a single point, specified geographical location with, it, with a physical presence at that location mouthful sorry um, however the current covid safe capacity of the council chamber means that not all members are able to attend physically and so for this meeting we have seven of the nine executive members in the council chamber as well as myself in attendance are the deputy leader councillor graham bridgman and other members of the executive councillor steve arderwater councillor dominic, dominic bowick Councillor Hilary Cole, Councillor Ross McKinnon, and Councillor Howard Wollaston. Members of the Shadow Executive attending in person this evening are Councillors Lee Dillon, Councillor Adrian Abbs, and Councillor Eric Pattenden. Those people in the chamber are sitting socially distanced and are thus permitted to remove their masks while seated. The majority of the officers attending the meeting and members of the public asking questions at today's meeting are also doing so remotely, unless they have requested to physically attend the meeting. The meeting is being live streamed via YouTube, so members of the public are able to follow proceedings. Other members of the Shadow Executive and the leader of the Minority Green Party are in attendance remotely. These members are entitled to speak and ask questions when invited to do so by myself. Other members of the council are also in attendance in the virtual waiting room and can ask questions on any items included on the agenda. They will do this by indicating electronically and I will then invite them to be brought in from the work virtual waiting room for their question to be answered. Members who are not on the executive are not able to vote on any of the agenda items. The officers in attendance this evening, either in person or remotely, include, for the last time, Nick Carter, our Chief Executive, and Executive Directors Sue Halliwell, Joseph Holmes, and Andy Sharp. Sarah Clark will be the legal advisor to the meeting. I'm assisted by Stephen Chard, the clerk to the meeting, and by Gordon Oliver, who will be acting as the Zoom host. I will now ask Stephen to give some reminders about the way we conduct council via meetings via Zoom. Thank you, Leader. Members, standard Zoom reminders are now being shown on screen. And in addition to those points, if it becomes necessary for any members to telephone into the meeting, you won't be able to signal to speak. So once everyone who's raised a Zoom hand has spoken, the Leader will be asked to invite anyone who has telephoned to speak uh, in order. Any voting necessary will take place via a physical show of hands. If it's necessary to adjourn the meeting at any point, the leader will adjourn and will advise the executive of the revised time and date of the meeting. If it's only a short adjournment, you'll be able to rejoin this Zoom meeting, otherwise a fresh appointment will be sent out. Do members have any questions about the way we'll conduct the meeting? Thank you. Okay. In which case, let's move to item one on our agenda this evening. Um, um, Stephen, do we have any apologies? Uh, we do, Leader, yes. Uh, apologies received from Councillor Richard Somner and Councillor Joe Stewart on the Executive. Also apologies from Councillor Jeff Brooks and Councillor Alan Macro from the Shadow Executive. Thank you, Stephen. Can we move on to item two then, minutes? Um, and I'd just like to ask if any, if members are willing to accept the previous minutes as an accurate record of the meeting held on the 10th of June, 2021. 
don't see any hands going up. I just wanted to actually highlight on them because I was reading through them earlier and on page 10 of the minutes, uh, it says that I pledge to speak to schools on the issue of tuition program uh, programs. And I just wanted to clarify that action has taken place uh, and Councillor Bowick will be talking on it later. Does, do the minutes find a seconder? Happy to second the leader. In which case, I'm happy um, that the minutes find a proposal for myself and a seconder in Councillor Bridgman, and I'm happy to sign them as approved minutes. Can I therefore ask um, the executive members to indicate by raising their actual hand if they agree that they're a true and accurate representation? Thank you, leader. I can confirm that that has been approved. Thank you, Sarah. Can we move to item three, declarations of interest? And um, does anybody have any declarations of interest um, they would like to declare just now? I don't see anybody in the room or any virtual hands. Can we therefore move on to item four, which is public questions? I'd like to thank all the members of the public that have submitted questions for this evening's executive meeting and welcome those of you able to be in attendance to hear the answer to your question and to answer a supplementary question if you have one. For those public questioners unable to join this meeting, I can confirm that you will receive a written response to your question within five clear working days of the meeting. Please note that in accordance with oh, sorry, please note that in accordance with the new processes, you will not need to say I asked the question standing in my name. Your question will appear on the screen and will be answered by the relevant portfolio holder. You will then be given the opportunity to ask a supplementary question, but please remember that this must be to clarify the response provided and not to introduce any new business. In accordance with paragraph 5.12.9 of the constitution, where questions have more than one question, where questioners have more than one question, only their first question will be answered. If after all other que first questions have been asked and answered, and there is sufficient time, we will subsequently um, answer all other questions. Please note that the time limit for your public questions is restricted to 30 minutes. And if your questions have not been answered in that time, you will receive a written response within five clear working days. The responses, the responses um, will be given either verbally at the meeting or in writing will be published um, on the council website in due course. I can move on. So Mr. Ian Hall has confirmed that he is unable to attend the meeting and will therefore receive a written response to his questions C, G, I and J. As Councillor Richard Sumner, the portfolio holder for planning and transport, has given his apologies to this meeting, questions put to him will also receive a written response. These are questions A, B, D and E. Mrs Jackie Painter is in attendance in person to ask her remaining question. Mr Paul Morgan is attending remotely to ask his remaining question. Could I therefore invite Councillor Steve Arderwater to answer Mrs. Jackie Painter's question F on the agenda? Uh, thank you for your uh, question, uh, Mr. Painter. Um, I sense a slight, uh, slight confusion in, in numbering, though. But in, in summary, um, the previous administration uh, initiated the Wildflower Verges uh, project. Um, head of the climate emergency. Ca We're very Councillor, happy. Councillor um, Ardwater, I've got a different question. I'm very sorry, Leader. I'm oh, looking, I've got question F as the planning question. If I can look into this, Leader, if you, you wish yeah. to progress with others, and then I will uh, hopefully find it. Yeah, the question the question on sorry to interrupt the question on screen uh is mrs painter's climate emergency uh, is that one you're expecting to answer Councillor Hardwater? that was what um yes i was that, uh, please carry on that's different to what i understood it to be then councillor Hardwater. i understood that that was a countryside question 
very good leader, and I've now quickly moved away from it. So apologies again. I'm sorry. Right, I do apologise for the delay, uh, Mr. Painter. Um, so the Wildflower Verges project was started uh, by the previous administration um, ahead of the climate emergency declaration. Um, I am very glad that, and, and I trust you are too, that uh, this project has been, uh, it is a three-year project, which has been delivered in partnership with the Berkshire Bucks and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. And it's going to provide a body of evidence on the best verges in the district, which support good populations of wildflowers, or those verges that have the potential to de develop wildflowers. Uh, you are you no doubt will be well aware of the, the fairly visible uh, trial stretches, in particular along the A4, but we are um, planning to make changes to the way which we manage most of our verges on an ongoing basis. Um, initial results from this year are very encouraging, and we do now intend to continue to promote wildflowers in verges across the district, recording what we find as the project continues. Do you have a supplementary question? Um, would you also consider letting other suitable areas grow naturally without regular cutting? And um, that would give the time freed up um, to keeping other public paths cleared. For instance, Barn Crescent, where there's been some complaint about the paths being overgrown with um, um, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Peter. And, and again, I, well, I, I can say that that um, all verges are looked at. It, it is a, actually a fairly complicated issue because, as well as the ecological benefits, which obviously we, we all want uh, for for a greater wildlife population and and habitats for animals, uh, we do have to consider um, safety and uh, public access and so on and so forth. So, where pop where possible, we will make this change. Uh, in, it won't be possible in all places. Uh, it is certainly not a cost-saving measure. Uh, just as much money is spent on the, the slower frequency of cutting as, as our regular regime is, but we will consider more. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs Painter. Um, as we've only got one other question, it would make sense to me to go to your second question just now, um, because you're stood there. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Mr Morgan won't mind, because I think we're going to have the half hour, so nobody's going to be disadvantaged. Is that all right, um, Sarah? Um, yes, I think you can um, change the... Yeah, as you're stood there. I've no idea what number it is now, so I will leave that to our clerk to put the question up. Yeah, I, I, just, I was just interrupting again, sorry. Is that the question, Mrs Payne's other question, was due for Councillor Somner. So this was one of the, the written answers to be given. So, yeah, so sorry to just disappoint, but... Um, OK, I'm, I'm sorry, we've got the questions confused the wrong way around, so apologies, you'll get a written answer for that one. Can I ask to... you could what you can do is you can email the supplementary once you've got your response because it may well be the written response um, gives you your supplementary so we'll get the written response to you and then you can ask your supplementary in response just email back and we'll make sure that that's covered okay, okay? Thank, you thank you can we therefore move to um question h which is mr paul morgan to councillor ross mckinnon uh thank you leader 
And uh, hello, Mr. Morgan, nice to see you again. Um, yes, all, all procurements with an estimated value of £10,000 or more uh, must be procured in accordance with Part 11 of the Council Constitution uh, using the Intend portal. Um, that can be accessed uh, via uh, the Intend website by members of the public, which will show all of those tenders for the Council. Uh, do you have a supplementary, Mr. Morgan? Hello. Hello. Can you confirm, is Mr. Morgan um, in attendance, Stephen? He's, he's just appeared on my Zoom screen. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Comments are coming from the audio. So Mr. Morgan, we can't hear you. I don't know if you've got um, anything else muted that you're talking to. I can see you unmuted on Zoom, but would you have your own volume up? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? I'm being told that he can be heard in other areas, but we can't hear. Mr. Morgan, I'm really sorry, we can't hear you in the chamber. Okay. Um, uh, but I... Bear with us. There's obviously a technical issue going on. Um, I'm just looking over to um, the clerk and the host to see if they can resolve it. So just bear with us one moment. So it looks like anybody that's, that's dialed in um, virtually can hear you, Mr. Morgan, but nobody in the chamber can. Um, I'm quite happy to read the, uh, if we get the text read out, would that work for everybody in the chamber? So Stephen, in the interest of proceeding, could you read out what Mr. Morgan is saying to us? Are you ready, Stephen? Would you I like to repeat your... Um, your supplementary, Mr. Morgan, yes, so that Stephen can read it out to us. I have tried to look on the Inten website, but I believe that's only for people who've. Yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm still not able to pick pick anything up um, at this moment in time. Do you want somebody else to read it out? Um, yeah. We don't know yeah. yet whether if. We can't hear Mr. Morgan, whether we can hear anybody. So can we test that? Um, can I ask everyone who is Zooming into this meeting to mute, except for Councillor Culver. Councillor Culver, could I ask you to speak so we can tell us whether or not we can hear you? Yes, speaking now, can you hear me? No. And the answer is no. no. Can, um, could I ask therefore that in the chat, <laughs> Councillor Culver, you put Mr. Morgan's supplementary question? Could you pop that in the chat? We can see the chat. There's obviously something going on with at our end. It, it may be worth noting that members can still phone in and the audio may be picked up on, um, on the telephone if, if we can't get this Zoom working. Let's deal with Mr. Morgan's supplementary first. <laughs> Caroline, can you hear me? Can you see me? <laughs> Okay, my, my supplementary question is... That hasn't come through on our chat either. It's coming through on uh, Caroline Culver's chat, isn't it, Caroline? Yeah. Okay, Mr Morgan, you, you speak. Um, we're seeing Councillor Culver's chat, so if you speak, um, Councillor Culver will type it into the chat for us. Okay. I believe that the intent um, website you refer to is only available to people who actually want to submit tenders, not for the public to actually view the tenders. That's my question. Oh, can you repeat that for me? Yes. Yeah. I believe the intent website is only available for... For... Anybody who watching, bear with want... us. We're just waiting for a chat to appear. For to companies who are, want to take part in the tender, not for the public to view it. Companies that want to take part in the tender. 
not for the public to view it. I think you need to be logged on as a as a tenderer to be able to see the tenders. That's what I First think. question. Councillor McKinnon. Okay. So, Paul, it says, I believe the intent website is only available for companies who want to take part in the tender, not for the public to view it. I could be wrong, but that's my understanding. If I'm wrong, could you could you provide details how I can access it? I'm dealing with this and then we're going to pause. I think we might even have to take a break. Yeah, we might have to have an adjournment while we sort this out. But I want to right. try and deal with our public questions. There we go. Ending that now, Paul. Councillor McKinnon. Uh, hi, Mr. Morgan. Um, no, as, as far as I'm aware, um, the public can log on to that uh, link and view the, the tenders for the council. Um, that's the information I have. If, if that's not the case, then I'm sure we can correct that at a, a later date. Um, okay. can, but, can uh, you, but yeah, that's, that's the answer that I have here at the moment. Well, can you check it, please? Because I can't access it. Thank you, Mr. Morgan, and um, thank you, thank you for bearing with us. It's not ideal. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for everyone that's asked questions. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for a five-minute adjournment to see if we can work out the technicalities of what's going on in the chamber because we know that this normally works. I have no idea why it's not working, but we cannot hear anybody in the virtual meeting. So please bear with us. We're going to take a five-minute adjournment, and I aim to be back um, with, within five minutes. So please bear with us. Masters has his hand raised in the attendees room. Okay, Councillor Masters. Hello, hello there. Um, Leader, sorry, it was a legacy hand just to say that um, Mr. Morgan's transcript was coming through on the transcript. So in the previous bit, so it was just a legacy from that. So no My petitions. Apologies. Okay. No petitions. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Masters. Uh, in which case, let's move on to item six on our agenda, which is the financial year 2020 21 annual Treasury outturn. Uh, I believe, Councillor McKinnon, you are going to introduce this report. Uh, thanks very much, Leader, and uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, yes, this is uh, just for members to note the, the annual Treasury outturn, which details the performance of the Treasury function for 2020 to 21. Uh, Treasury management makes important decisions around the Council's finances. Uh, firstly, we're to deposit and invest the Council's excess cash balances, which fluctuate throughout the year and are impacted by Council tax, business rates, receipts, other payments and receipts to and from central government. Uh, that investment decision and the desire to maximise interest income is counterbalanced by the need to ensure adequate liquidity and cash flow to meet expected and unexpected cash outflows. The other side of Treasury management's work is managing the Council's borrowings, some of which have been inherited from the old Berkshire County Council. Others are loans from the Public Works Loan Board to support the capital programme and commercial property investments. And of course, our groundbreaking UK first community municipal investment, for which I'm delighted to say that the Council has been shortlisted for industry awards for innovation. Uh, the work of Treasury management impacts the budget then in two ways, uh, generating income from the Council's excess cash balances and managing the interest and capital repayments on the Council's borrowings. Now, as you would imagine, both sides of that equation are affected by the prevailing level of interest rates. Uh, the Council invests with counterparties like UK government, local authorities and prime rated banks and money market funds. Now, with such low risk comes low return and rates are lower than last year. But happily, PWLB rates, which offer a margin over UK guilt rates, uh, they are also lower by comparable amounts. And as the council has more borrowings than cash investments, a fall in rates happens to be a net benefit to the revenue budget. Uh, overall, borrowing is £9 million lower at the year end compared to March 2020, further demonstrating the sustainability and prudence of the council's financial strategy. Thanks, Leader. Does anybody have any particular questions for Councillor McKinnon with regards to this report? 
No, none from the executive. Um, Councillor Dillon. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, it was ju just to pick up, uh, Councillor McKinnon, on the, the last comment about the net borrowing figure being down from March uh, the previous year. Um, how much of that is due to delayed capital projects, for example, um, because of COVID? Thank you. Yep, thanks, Mr. Dillon. Uh, really, the reduction in borrowing really comes from two sources. Firstly, the delay in the capital programme uh, because of COVID delays and also cash income from government in, in, the, in the form of, of COVID support. So a combination of two. Thank you. Councillor Abbs. Yeah, thank you very much, Leader. Yes, Councillor McKinnon, I'm well, looking through the, uh, the, detail, um, the report with uh, interest and uh, I was looking at the, um, the makeup of the portfolio that we have uh, commercial wise. And I note that we, we still own a petrol station. So I'm just wondering what the, uh, your your thoughts are on divesting from this fossil fuel type investment, given our declaration of a climate emergency. How soon will we be doing that? Oh, yeah, thanks, Councillor Rams. Um, the filling station up in Dudley is a purely commercial investment. Uh, we don't make a value judgment on uh, the nature of the products that are sold. You'll know also that we're invested in a Sainsbury's. You know, I would say that we're no more invested in the fossil fuel industry than we are invested in baked beans, which Sainsbury's also sells. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't accept the comparison. I just, you have a question, yeah, Councillor no, no, just, 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 just comment on uh, 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 to uh, Councillor Abbs. Councillor Abbs raises a very good point. And it's a, it's, a, it's a question that we considered when we acquired that, that, uh, the filling station. And, and the, the argument um, that, 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 that um, swayed us was that properties, uh, investments such as uh, a filling station will continue to deliver returns when eventually they, they, they convert into uh, um, uh, locations where people can charge their uh, their vehicle, while at the same time doing some convenient shopping. So I think we will be supporting in due course that transition from fossil fuels to um, to electric power. Oh, so it's rather than divesting, you're looking to change the way the uh, the I guess the carbon outset of that as asset. Then is that is that actually a plan that you're going to change it to an electric charging station? Well, no, we don't. We don't. Op we don't operate the uh, uh, the filling station. You're just the landlord. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your clarification, Councillor Bowick. Um, having an organisational memory, um, as you do, of being around when that was first um, introduced. So thank you. Any, any other questions for Councillor McKinnon? Well, th this report is to note. Um, Councillor Dillon, I take that's not, yeah. Um, this report is only to note, so there's no actual um, vote on it. So thank you very much, Councillor McKinnon. Uh, in which case, uh, we can move on to item seven on our agenda this evening, which is the Environment Strategy Delivery Plan. Uh, and Councillor Ardwater, I believe that you wish to introduce this report, but before you do so, does that find a seconder? Yes, very, very happy to second that, Leader. Thank you, Councillor McKinnon. Um, back to you, Councillor Ardwater. Uh, thank you, Leader. And um, uh, again, as you will see in your papers, uh, members, uh, the um, the request here, the, the the outcome which is being sought is approval of the Environment Strategy Delivery Plan, which uh, is the delivery vehicle for the Environment Strategy, which itself was, uh, in case people have forgotten, agreed almost exactly one year ago, on July the 16th, uh, last year. So as you will see from the papers, the delivery plan is the result of an awful lot of work by officers uh, after uh, the strategy was, was finalised. Uh, we've been through a very thorough consultation and there have been some very good quality uh, pieces of feedback which have been received and incorporated uh, into uh, the plan uh, since then. Um, the uh, Inevitably, uh, this uh, plan of itself will not deliver automatically the key goal of carbon neutrality for the district for the simple uh, reason that this council represents only a small proportion of the district's overall carbon footprint. However, having said that, we the council have a duty, uh, we are in a position of leadership, uh, we have a duty to set an example, and we are the enabler 
uh, for, for a far wider uh, set of actions uh, by in particular residents, but also uh, businesses and groups within the district. Uh, Councillor Burke and, and Councillor Adams just touched on the, the, the issue of petrol stations. And one nice example of a one of the many projects under this plan is the uh, rollout by this council of public electric vehicle charging points, which has started and will continue. Um, as well as the many, many uh, projects which uh, members will find within the plan, uh, I would draw your attention to the way in which we intend to be as transparent and open uh, as possible over the coming years. Uh, and in particular, the plan which will be published on uh, the Council website, providing it is approved here tonight, will be updated every month. And every year, a, a, a high level summary will be presented to the executive uh, showing uh, progress against a number of targets. So we're aiming to be very transparent. Uh, there are some very tough targets ahead, but I'm confident that given the uh, the amount of work and the uh, overall, the unified sense of commitment, uh, not just by this administration, but of all the parties within the council, um, uh, recalling that we, uh, we did have a unanimous agreement to achieve uh, carbon neutrality, um, that we uh, as, as local elected councillors can set the lead for residents. And I'm confident that uh, we, we are going to do all that we possibly can to hit that high level uh, target, as well as improve life in a number of ways, including our natural environment. So thank you, Leela. That is the report and I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you, Councillor Alderwater. Um, I'd just say from the chair, I'd like to thank both you and the service for the level of engagement that you undertook with regards to this plan and the delivery plan. Uh, I actually watched your Facebook live session, uh, but what's really reassuring is in 4.5 of the report where you actually outline how um, those additional actions have been incorporated and included into the delivery plan. Uh, and it won't surprise you to hear me say, I'm really pleased that that level of engagement and actually listening to that level of engagement incorporated into the plan really shines through. So I'd just like to commend you and, and the service for that work. So thank you for doing that. Um, I'm going to go to the executive first. So, um, Councillor Bridgman, you have your hand up. Thank you, Leader. Um, and it's a fairly minor point, um, but um, there's a reference in the uh, paper to less frequent mowing of hedgerows, which I basically support. And indeed, we had a question earlier about wildflower verges and so on and so forth. I just want to ensure that in that, obviously, with all of these things, there's always a tension. Um, between public interest and what we do to facilitate the environment. And um, I am well aware of a tension in my ward that I've raised with um, transport and planning uh, to deal with uh, overgrown hedgerows, if I can put it like that, which are getting onto footways and causing problems for the public. So I just want to recognise that there is that tension uh, in our delivery of anything like this and to make sure that with all of this, we are still um, taking the safety of our residents into account because um, we don't want them forced out into the road because we've allowed some hedgerows to get somewhat overgrown. That's a simple comment. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Bridgman. Um, Councillor Culver. Thank you, Leader. Can you hear me okay? We can. Hooray. Right. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Ardwater. And I just want to pass on my thanks to Jenny Graham and her colleagues as well for all their hard work on this. So I'd echo what the leader said. Um, there's a couple of points I wanted to make. I'm very conscious that in my ward and in many of the rural wards, we have a lot of large landowners who are doing a lot of good work um, around leaving field margins free for nesting birds and wildflowers and so on and the way they plant the fields and they vary the planting from year to year. Um, and I'm conscious that many of them have said they haven't heard anything about the council strategy. Um, I think it would be a quick win for us if we were to reach out to those landowners, not least because our target is to become carbon neutral as a district, you know, not just as a council, but as a district. And we have very many large landowners who can work very closely with us on this and we can learn from one another. You know, I'm sure we can learn from the landowners and they can learn from one another. So if we can try perhaps organise some sort of forum or some sort of way of reaching out to them. I think that would be really positive. 
Um, and something that I commented on when we had the public consultation on this document, one of my concerns is that the timescales um, are not particularly um, detailed. So, for example, a medium term thing can be achieved between 2023 and 2026, which is a very long period of time. So I wonder when you bring forward the monthly reports, whether we could start to introduce a little bit more detailed time scale so that we understand when these various things are going to be achieved. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for your uh, questions, uh, Councillor Culver. Um, so regarding the first one on landowners, that's a, that's a very timely point, actually. Um, I'm, I'm not quite ready to make an announcement, but we are actively planning with a number of partner organisations exactly the sort of structure of engagement with uh, landowners and other interested parties regarding the natural environment. And in, indeed, that's exactly what we need to do to, to, to engage more fully. Um, obviously, obviously, that takes uh, resource and time, um, but that resource is being built up uh, within the delivery team. So I'm hopeful that, that within the coming um, ideally two months, I can't make carbon bars promise, we'll be able to start making concrete uh, steps forward, um, which uh, will we'll, we'll inform you and colleagues through the environmental advisory group. Um, regarding your second point on um, clarity of timescales, again, that's a very good point. Um, as, as you will see, as everyone will see from the number of um, entries in the delivery plan, there is a huge amount of material there. And what officers have been forced to do is, is basically log in a fairly crude and quick way um, all the actions that need to be done and allocated and so on and so forth. As time goes on, uh, I, I'm very keen that, that we do indeed, as you say, to become more and more um, precise and focus on deliverable actions, not not uh, necessarily all at once, not all can be all at once, but certainly be very clear that we are going to need to continue delivering each and every year in order to deliver many of these, these things. So absolutely, there are many placeholders there which need to become rather more precise, and they will. Thank you both. Can I go to Councillor Abs next? Thank you very much, Leader. Um, yeah, I guess the uh, first thing I would also like to say thanks very much to the officers. They've done some sterling work, and it is... Well, we have so much to do that, uh, yeah, no wonder it's uh, taken some time. Obviously, I'm a little disappointed it's two years since the climate emergency to, to have it, but we have it and we can move forward from it. The first um, thing I'd like to say is a, um, we, we as the Lib Dems definitely like contributing to EAG and, and to what's going on there. And it was great to see some of the stuff coming out uh, in the plan as well, especially the 10 megawatt uh, facility over Graysley, which uh, is one of the very first things I su suggested to the council. So that's good. And I'm hoping that yeah, you, you continue to consider enlarging that to the 60 megawatts that was actually the original uh, suggestion. But um, anyway, that's by the by. Um, there are three main areas that I wanted to comment on. Um, one is a bit like, uh, one, one's very minor. It's um, very, very early and it talks about the ULIV strategy and it refers to a document that's linked there and it's still referring to um, fossil fuel cars being ended in 2040 when of course the government's announced it will end it. So that just needs a quick amend there, please. Um, there was another one to do with building to higher standards and I think wording is really important. A high, a high standard is not what we're aiming for in West Berkshire. A net zero or better carbon positive should be what we need to aim for. But it's got a lot, a lot of offsetting to do. So I really like to see the, the wording tightened up there from high standard to, to kind of a more of a net zero focus. Um, there's also a, a comment in there about um, how hard it is going to go and how hard it is to reach 60% of recycling. Um, and the only reason I find that slightly strange is just, just last week, um, South Oxfordshire, there was Lib Dem on the telly showing that they're, they're already there, of course, uh, number three um, in, the, uh, in the UK, I believe. And really they're there because they have a weekly foods uh, collection service, which we have, but they also have, or will have, sorry, very shortly, uh, and they uh, then do NRI with digestion and so on. So they're already at 60. So the comment I'm saying is that we are saying in our document, oh, it's, it's quite a tough target to reach, but actually this one thing or one difference seems to pretty much get you there. So isn't it more realistic to say a hard target might be 70% or 80%? 60% it doesn't seem that hard when others are very close to us are able to do it very quickly. 
Um, yeah, the, the other big thing uh, I'd like to say is I think the, the, the public need more engagement still. And uh, it's already been pointed out that we're going for a West Berkshire net zero, not a council net zero. So I think we need a thermometer. I think we need a thermometer that should, that's updated quarterly to show us how we're doing it against the West Berkshire target. Because I am a little afraid, and you, you've been caveating your words there, Steve, to saying how hard and we must bring others along to do it, et cetera, et cetera, which is the language of saying we're actually going to miss the target. So to avoid that and to make sure we get everybody on board, everybody needs to see just how far we've got to go. And even if West Berkshire Council gets to 100%, um, that doesn't mean we've any anywhere near our target for 2030. So I'd really, I don't hope you engage with that and, and come up with some kind of simple KPI, a simple measure that we can update quarterly, say this is how we're doing against the target. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to look at, I looked at detail in the report because um, I worked with uh, with Jenny and John Wynne Stanley and some of the great officers we've got working on this uh, about that plan. I went through it in detail with them and I really checked um, the current one and just so everybody knows, we have what one, two, three, four, five, five different areas, and they are 26% of the planning actions not started, 62% of the actions not started, 44 not started, 46 not started, and 54. So basically half of what we need to do hasn't been started yet, which is why I'm so worried about actually reaching the end target. And some of those are actually things that are meant to be short-term gains. So I'm sorry I went on there a little bit, but there's some, it's something that's quite important to me and lots of other people, I'm sure. But overall, great, we've got a plan. That, that, let's crack on faster. Thank you, Councillor Abs. And it may be worthwhile remembering the last 18 months that we've been going through. Indeed, uh, but indeed, I will indeed. hand over to Councillor Alderwater to come back on that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your uh, your questions and comments there, Councillor Abt. Um, the first three I totally agree with and are as a result of what I said earlier about uh, workload and, and surge of having to do things quickly. Uh, so, um, trusting I remembered these in the right order, uh, ULEV charging, absolutely, it's, uh, it is out of date, it will be updated. The um, building standards, likewise, we put that in early in the document and I, I also picked up on that. So that will be and, and need to be updated with the little standards. And again, the waste target, you're quite right, 60% is, is a, would be a great thing for us now, but will not be an adequate target uh, in five or six years' time. So again, we will we will look at that and we will update that. Um, then uh, your, your final two points, uh, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, firstly, in terms of the thermometer, uh, that's a great concept. Uh, the catch that I see is, is not just showing the district how far we've got to go, which is a very good thing, but knowing where the district is. And it is much, much easier to, with an organisation such as this council to track our actual carbon footprint and actions and so forth. It's hugely difficult uh, to, to make an accurate uh, estimate in with timely statistics on how many, uh, on the carbon footprint of each and every one of our residents. So definitely something good to look at, but I sense more challenge there when, when going beyond the boundaries of, uh, of this council. Um, overall though, uh, thank you for your comments and I'm, I'm sure we'll continue engaging and improving and working forward. Thank you both. Um, Councillor Vickers. Yeah, thank you, Leader. I, I was most impressed with the report. There's so much detail in it. Uh, so well done the officers for me as well. And I'm not on EAG, but I trust my other half to uh, to help uh, keep everything going. Um, and that leads me on to the second point, because um, I, I really move straight to the risk register, because, you know, we, we are, in this council anyway, all united, we all want to move in the same direction. We may have different ideas about priorities, you know, which projects are the priority. But I think from the point of view of the public, until they're getting good, healthy food grown locally that is reasonably cheap, until they're getting fuel for travel, whatever method they use, cheaper, uh, and until their heating bills are lower, there's not really going to be the buy-in. Buy-in is absolutely crucial. And But, you know, the emphasis in your response, uh, Councillor Arderwater, was, was the quality of feedback. 133 completed forms from a district of what how many adults how many people 
it's not an impressive quantity. So I think there's a lot of work to be done to engage with and achieve buy-in from communities. I, I absolutely agree with Councillor uh, Culver that landowners are a very important stakeholder group, but they're easier to deal with. And in a way, we're lucky that West Berkshire is known for its small number of very large landowners. So it's actually easier to engage with landowners when there aren't too many of them than say in where I come from, Devon, where it's mainly small farmers and, and you know, engaging with hundreds of small farmers is more difficult than, than say 25 or so, which I, I think 25 landowners I read somewhere account for most of this district. Um, so they are vital. So some prioritization and something that really catches the headlines um, of the general public. And that's where the greening campaign approach, I think, will, will work in that you can give individual households some quick wins where they see it represented in their budget. Um, just moving on to a couple of other risk, uh, risks in the risk register, um, apart from buy-in. You talk about politics, and I wasn't sure whether you meant the politics locally or the politics nationally. But you know, when you, when you look at our target now, 2030 for zero carbon, and we look at the end of the coalition when my party had this portfolio hold portfolio nationally. As soon as we came out of cab, uh, coalition, they ditched all the green crap, frankly. You know, and we've lost five years. Okay, we're now we're now seriously moving in the right direction, and the government has really got to show willing with COP26 later this year. But, but I feel the risk is at the national level and not at the local level. I'm very I've got a very warm feeling about how we are all united in wanting to get where we've got to go. But so much of what needs doing is dependent upon government action. I mean, for example, if you want warmer homes and you don't want to demolish and rebuild, why have we got 20%, 25% VAT on renew um, re refurbishment and zero on new build? I know, can, 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 we, can we come back to the report, please? Yeah, I'm just saying that the risk is that national okay. level. Okay, okay. we, we take that, that point. Can we move on? I'm not sure that was the to other people you know. that wish to speak. Okay, right. Well, that's that's uh, good. Good work, but the politics is the worry. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Bickers, and, and uh, there, there are some good points in your, your response there. Um, the, the intent, or certainly the intent in my mind, about the comment on politics is, is actually a generic one, and it applies absolutely at national level, as you said, but generically it's an issue for us here at local level as well, because the, the sense... The sense in my mind is that the, the politics is actually about choices and conflicts, and you will know very well the conflict between affordable houses and, and obviously mediated by greedy builders um, and, um, uh, and environmental standards. In other words, there's a, there's a trade-off, and the political choice has to be the right balance between those two. But point made, well made, and, and thank you for your comments. Thank you both. Can we go to Councillor Dillon now? Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, I, I wasn't going to talk on it. I don't think that the, the debate is about affordable housing or carbon zero housing. I think that as a country, we should aspire to be able to have both. Uh, I don't think it's beyond the wit of man to have both. Um, I think it actually it comes back to a land value um, issue and developers uplift. Um, that's not what I was going, was going to talk about. Um, I wanted to, to reinforce Councillor Abbott's point whilst taking on board uh, what Councillor Ardar Water said about the thermometer. This is a very technical subject, um, but it's an emotive matter. And we have to make that join and we have to make it real for people. Now, I'm not, I, I don't have a scientific background. And so actually 3,800 tonnes of carbon doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know if that's a lot or not a lot, you know, in terms of what is the challenge that we're facing here. Um, so I think we should try to quantify uh, that West Berkshire carbon footprint. Um, as best as we can, and let's be honest about it and say, you know, this is a this is a, um, an assumption on where we think we are, with the best data that we can at this point in time, um, and then show how we're getting to it. Because the only reason we've got this delivery plan is because this council passed a unanimous motion to be carbon neutral by 2030. So that is the target that was driving all of this work. So I think there has to be some way that we can reflect that back to the public um, of how we are collectively as a district uh, achieving that. And obviously that was the motion that we passed in this chamber, not just to be inward looking, but to use our enabling and leadership uh, skills to be able to deliver carbon neutrality across the district by 2030. 
Thank you, Leader. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Dillon, and I, I, I totally sympathise with your the, the, the desire you've got, and I, I, I share it too. So, indeed, we, we'll look at how best to uh, convey a simple message uh, with with timely data to residents. And uh, no, that, 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 indeed, that would be a, a great thing to have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, um, Councillor Marsh. Thank you. Um, just a couple of specific questions about the report um on uh, electrical charging points for vehicles um have you you mentioned this and you say there are going to be a lot more which is great uh, you say where some of them will be have you come round uh to the idea that many of us have been promoting which is that they need to be in dedicated uh bays um where they are where they are in bays because at the moment as we know the ones in newbury um, are largely unusable because they're outside people's houses and people park in them. Um, clearly, if it's in a car park, that's dedicated, and you mentioned that. But um, for the bays, um, I'd like to know if that's the plan. And completely unrelated to that, well, apart from in the most general sense, I thought that the you mentioned the LC Whip and other move, moves that have been made towards active travel, which is, and I must say, I'm very, very enthusiastic indeed about the LC Whip plans. It's great. Um, but we've had a lot of money from the government to promote active travel during COVID-19. Is there going to be the money to advance those plans? Because it's not going to be cheap to put in the cycle lanes and the other measures. And we, you know, it's one of the things that will make a big, big difference. So can we uh, take it that, for example, you'll be putting the money into the budget for next year and subsequent years to get that work done if it isn't necessarily forthcoming um, in every case from the government and from other grant? Uh, sources. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your uh, questions, uh, Councillor Marsh. Uh, so on the domestic uh, electric vehicle charging points issue, as, as, as I think all members, if, well, certainly most members will be very well aware, this is a quite a, uh, almost an emotive subject. Um, right now, we're at the stages where, where le less than 1% of, of uh, vehicles in this district are electric. That number, I'm confident, will grow and grow quite rapidly over the coming years as the economics and the government signals uh, towards electrification become clearer. And it is up to us as the council to ensure that no one who is intending to buy an electric vehicle and who does not have off-street parking, uh, they, they do not have a drive and, and, and the facility to do that, uh, can charge their car as and when they need to. So what we will come up with is a scheme that drives investment and a provision of uh, off-street parking where needed. Um, inevitably, we will have a, a slow start as we have already, and that will things will gradually accelerate, uh, pardon the pun, as and when more and more uh, vehicles become electric. There will be a point, of course, when this will be entirely uncontroversial and almost all uh, off street park, oh, sorry, on street parking will have uh, access to uh, electricity. We just need to manage that transition over the coming years. Um, regarding your second point on LC Whip, thank you for your um, uh, expression of an enthusiasm and support, and I share that. I also share your concern that these things are horribly expensive, particularly when engineered solutions need to be built onto highways for safety. And I do hope that uh, access to funding will continue. But again, please rest assured that this is one of the five priorities of this council, and we will ensure that delivery of that plan will progress at a satisfactory lick over the coming years. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, Councillor McKinnon, I believe you were seconding, but you haven't actually spoken yet. Do you wish to add anything to the debate? Yes, thanks, Leader. Um, well, I, th I think I'd echo quite a few points, actually. I think the engagement on this um, strategy as a whole has been excellent. You know, starting, I think, all the way back to the climate conference that we had back in October 2019 um, and through all the public consultations thereafter. Um, and this delivery plan really represents the latest evolution in our journey towards net zero. And some other contributors have, have already mentioned um, how, how much hard work the officers have put into this. And that's certainly true. Uh, and I would echo that completely, particularly as the leader said, during the time of COVID, which came upon us in March 2020, I think it's remarkable progress uh, to get to this stage at this time. Um, you know, I won't name the officers again, but I would say, and I'm sure they didn't mean to, to miss it, I, 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 but I didn't hear it, but I'm going to say it now. 
Also a big well done to you, because I know how personally engaged and passionate you are about this. And, and I sit on the environment board with Councillor Arda Walter and Councillor Sumner and the senior officers. Uh, and I've seen it firsthand the amount of hard work. So this is a, a great testament to you personally, uh, as well as the hard work of our officers. So I'll leave my comments there, Leader, and happy to second the report. Thank you, Councillor McKinnon. OK, we have recommendations in front of us in 2.1, which is to approve the Environment Strategy Delivery Plan as included in Appendix C um, of your papers, and to agree the proposed process for monitoring, updating, and reporting on the progress of the plan as de detailed in Section 5 of this report. Um, please can executive members vote by raising their actual hand in favour of the proposals to approve the recommendations. Thank you, Leader. I can confirm that that has been approved. Thank you, Sarah. Um, in which case, let's move on with this evening's agenda and let's go to item eight. That's the Time Lord 2 final report. Um, Councillor Howard Wollaston, I believe you're going to introduce this report and I'm very happy to second this report from the Chair. Thank you, Leader. Uh, many organisations, both private and public sector, either have or are going through this process. COVID-19 has without doubt been the catalyst for the recognition that home working can work efficiently. Clearly it is more appropriate for some roles and there is a need to retain corporate culture, team working, mentoring of junior staff and the induction of new recruits. A detailed consultation of all staff was undertaken and is currently being repeated. The main benefits are providing staff with a better work-life balance, getting the newbie buildings reduced from three to one, making the council more environmentally friendly by reduced travel to work time. There is a cost implication of re revamping the building, this building, but these costs are offset by savings which will be derived from property disposals. To be clear, no member of staff will be forced to work from home. We will be free to come into the office to work if they choose. We anticipate that most staff will choose to work on a mixed basis. There is no doubt in my mind that the principle of Time Lord is unquestioned and the recommendations contained in 3.2 on page 109. And it should be approved by the executive, although there is some more detailed design work resulting from the ongoing staff consultation. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, um, Councillor Wollaston. Members of the executive, do you have any questions for Councillor Wollaston? No, in which case I'm gonna go across to Councillor Dillon. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Leader. Um, I have um, the, the, the HR uh, functions of the council and um, sit within um, our deputy leader's portfolio, who's um, uh, given his apologies. Um, but I do have 12 questions, leader, um, to ask on it. Um, so it's up to you on, on it, if you want to take all of those now. Um, can, I tell you what, should we do them in batches of three and see if, how far we get? Because he could always submit them to Councillor Wollaston uh, if they're technical, Councillor Dillon, because I'm sure Councillor Wollaston would be happy to answer um, okay. Councillor Brooks direct. Yeah, okay. I, th I think that, um, I think for, from all sides, uh, sorry, from all of my members on the Shadow Executive, um, there is an acceptance about home working going forward. And this paper is not about COVID per se. Um, and we, we recognize that. Um, however, we do have uh, concerns about the decisions and the time scales mm -hmm. when they're being taken. Um, so the, the first one is obviously we've just appointed a new CEO. Um, and so that uh, given that it's an operational sort of document about how we work, it's well, why not wait for, for their input into this? Um, interestingly, in 4.11 and 7.8, um, which refers to the key principles of why we're doing this, none of it refers to our residents or about the quality of services that they receive. Um, it talks about efficiency and then it talks about staff. Um, and actually, the reason we're here is to provide services. And so we think that it needs some more focus there. Um, also, that it states that the new arrangements can better support service users from home, but it doesn't evidence how that um, has materialised. So we, we'd like some more information on that as well, please. Um, do you want me to stop there, Lido, and then do another batch? What I'm going to do is give Councillor Wollaston the option of answering what he can and giving written responses for the other elements. Is that OK? OK. Uh, the first one was whether we should wait until the new CEO has been in place. Uh, that clearly will be October, as we now know. Um, the reason, I think, for pushing forward 
is first as i said at the outset not many many organizations are going through the same process so it's not exactly novel um and there is a thought that because we've been through the, the coronavirus and people have got used to working from home and or working either from home or the office that we don't really want to stop that process we don't really want to drag people, everyone back into the office um so I think it's, it's a, we're not expected to do it immediately. It'll be a gradual process. There's a lot of, a lot of work to do on this, this building for a start to make it work. And the new CEO will have a chance to obviously have an input into that. Uh, the second one, I wholly agree with you that the, there should be more emphasis on services we provide to residents. Um, that's perhaps an omission from the report, but it's not intentional. It's all part of it. Um, and I'm sorry, I did catch the last one. Some to service users, I think you said. Um, yeah, <clears throat> sorry, in the report, it states that uh, new arrangements, it's a quote, can better support service users from home. So it was what examples do we have of that if we're asking the executive to make that decision tonight? I think I may have to come back to you on that one. Um, the, the, the next one's leader. Um, so 20 to 30% of our workforce don't have a dedicated office space at home. Um, so how will we ensure confidentiality and privacy of screens, um, you know, we're dealing with residents and vulnerable people's data here, neighbours, colleagues, you know, people we can see in the community. Um, so how will we ensure that going forward under this model? Um, the core hours are ceasing um, under 8.37. Um, so in effect, employees could simply decide that they won't start until 11 or finish at 8. Um, again, there's just that service continuity delivery there about how do residents know how to get hold of, of key officers? Um, uh, 11.3, it says that we haven't considered the impact on residents and customers. But if we haven't considered the impact on residents and customers, that would lead to me to say that we need to before we then implement this decision. So actually, there probably should be a break point put in, in place uh, for that piece of work to happen. Do you want me to stop there, leader? Yeah. Thank you. Um, the first point you made is that 20 to 30% 20 don't have dedicated workspace um, and confidential anxiety issues, which I totally accept. Um, I would imagine a lot of those 20 to 30% would actually choose to work from the office. But, but how can we guarantee the security of our data through our home work? I think that's been an issue right through COVID, to be honest. But it has, but this is that was responding to... Uh, an extreme event this is putting a strategy in place to go forward as a permanent way of working i just think the way the, the way forward in the world is, is not to sort of have the traditional way of getting people to come in at nine o'clock and leave at five we should be looking to give them a better work-life balance I, I'm, I'm on about how do we ensure the confidentiality i, I appreciate that but, but there are some things which perhaps have to be compromised slightly to achieve that okay so 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 vulnerable children's data could be compromised but to allow someone to work from home i mean i'm just talking about the, the I, level I, of data we hold as an organization you know, I, is I, life I wholly, or death, death? I'm not trying to be frivolous with it. However, no, I, I, I wholly appreciate where you're coming from, and it's something we're going to have to work on. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, um, uh, the final one is, is repeat again. Residents as customers, no question. Well, it's slightly different. So you were saying that you appreciate the, the document should have more of a focus, Absolutely. but this is purposely saying that it has not considered the impact on residents or customers as a deliberate uh, part of its documentation. So surely that should be before you implement its findings. It should be. That's part of the, the next process that we're going to go through of uh, working through the next probably six, nine months. Okay, thank you. Um, ne nearly finished, Leader. <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. Um, so you, you've got the review of its effectiveness in six months' time, um, and, and you just alluded to that there. Um, but you've actually, you, we talk about the office um, going from three into one as well. Um, so what if we were in contract at that point and we didn't have the offices to go back to something? So after six months, if it doesn't work, will we have the, the office space available to us to be able to, to, to go back to, to, to maybe a, a similar way of working now, for example? Um, and then that links in with a, a comment that you said um, that anyone who work, wants to work from the office can do. But if we're condensing three offices into one, that's probably mathematically impossible to do. If everyone decided to come in on a Friday, you would not have the desks, sir. <laughs> um, firstly, we have already come to the conclusion that, that sharing your view, that we can't risk um, letting go of those two offices until we're absolutely certain it works. Um, that decision's already been made. Um, the reality of everyone coming in on one day, I think, is, is nil, frankly. 
I mean, there's a, still quite a lot of work to be done in terms of uh, shaping the space that we have here um, and making sure it does work. And then just the the, the, the generic point, um, and I think that, that this will find favour on all sides, is on, obviously we know that we're asking for new employees to be in for six months um, into the office, and that's great because that training, um, but they need to be assigned buddies and mentors yes. because they might end up being the only person in the office that day, <laughs> you know, and everyone else is working from home. So there's some of those real practicalities uh, to work for as well. But th thanks for those answers. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let Councillor Bowick come back in because I think he wanted to come in and he hadn't had the opportunity to. Thank you, Lydia. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, um, talk to uh, uh, Councillor Dillon's point about confidentiality. Um, we, already we have people working from home who, who, who have access to the most sensitive um, um, data. I'm a, I'm a member of, uh, uh, of West Berkshire Fostering Panel. I, every month I receive some very confidential data related to children and, and their carers. Um, and I get, I get that at home. The secure um, systems that we have in place to allow us access to that data are extremely robust. And then at the end of the day, um, whether people are in offices or in uh, very uh, uh, elaborate home offices, uh, our, our, our employees have access to data, which if they were irresponsible or dishonest, they could share. So we have to, I think, accept that um, uh, we have to trust uh, that our people. That wasn't my point. I, I did not trust our staff. I was saying about, um, so for example, my wife could walk through the front room while I'm on a phone call, um, you know, talking about, um, you know, a vulnerable child. But it's about if 20 to 30 percent of the workforce don't have an I don't have an office at my house. I'm not not Councillor Dillon. If you were if I work if, from the if dining you were in table. that situation, you would well, rather you would not put yourself in that in that situation such that it could arise. And, okay, and so, that's so it's down to the staff to do it, not for the managers, just to, to double check about that 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 safe working environment in terms of data management. Well, I, I mean, the procedures that will be, I'm sure that Councillor Williston will get back to you on the procedures. But I wanted to make the point about about. We're, all, we're already sharing confidential information with our employees. There has to be a de degree of trust, otherwise system will break, break down. Okay, I'm going to stop this now because there's actually mandatory training on an annual basis and quarterly to um, reported quarterly to corporate board around um, data protection and ensuring not in ensuring that those breaches aren't happening. So we already train our staff. So I think there's a combination here of tra staff training um, alongside um, personal responsibility, actually, Councillor Dillon, if I'm, I'm honest, you know where you're in a profession. Yeah. And what I would say is those um, systems have been tested to the very limit over the last 15 to 18 months because we've been forced into a situation where we have all had to work from home. And as far as I'm aware, there haven't actually been any breaches uh, in data protection over that period of time. So I think we've already tested out our own systems and we continue to make sure that we do staff training. And that staff training will very much have to be tailored towards where we might have been doing staff training within the office environment. Actually, how might that look different if I'm working at home? The exact conversation you're having is where I'm having a confidential conversation can I be overheard and that will all very much come down to our staff training and our ability to make sure that staff are comfortable with that and, and that's excellent uh, and thank you for for that they didn't say it in the papers so okay. that's why we were raising it as a concern and thank you for that 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 concern I've got councillor abs next thank you very much leader um I read through the paper and there were just a few things that struck me. The first one, when I read through it, was related to the impact on the town um, because the paper is very much focused on what's good for the council, what's good for its employees, et cetera. But the reality is if we go three to one, three, three to one off it, more people working from it, that means there's far less foot, foot, footfall. And I think the document does mention about an impact. I, couldn't, I don't remember seeing a number associated with the impact. And that's important to me. The town's already suffering. And um, I don't want to use the word abandon, but I just did. Uh, is West Berkshire Council abandoning West Berkshire to an extent? It's, um, you know, it may be interpreted this way, but uh, so let, let, let's have some real number there about the impact we're going to have on the town, especially. And the second bit was um, on the financial page 110. And uh, 
it talks about will save, a very definite, and I mentioned earlier about wording being important, and it absolutely is going to save it, will save uh, under these, um, these conditions. However, the, the time frame, the certainty is not there for me, uh, if only because we've got a six month review. So it might save, would be a, a more appropriate language to use rather than it will save. Because once you say you will see, save, and then you're going to say, and that's going to lead to a million pounds because we've got a million pound commitment over the next five years for these offices. And okay, that's a million pounds. However, if you don't actually, you know, you, you, you effectively bring everybody here, but you can't do anything with them for the next three years, you, your whole program gets blown out. Now, I'm sure Councillor McGinnon will be on top of this because it's a financial type of thing. I have no doubt he's an accountant, so he'll be on top of it. But as it reflects as language within this document, I think we need to be a, a little bit more careful in the language that we use and assumptions that, you know, everybody will want to work from home. Everybody could work from home. And, you know, even Apple has uh, gone from... Uh, gone from a position of saying everybody it's okay to work from home and they've tried to bring their, their uh, at least three days a week so they're looking at what two fifth two fifths of a move back uh, sorry two fifths of working from home what is our underlying assumption is it three fifths four fifths and that percentage becomes very important because it affects how many desks we need how many offices we need, how much we're impacting the town. And, and the final thing I wanted to, that started coming into my head when I read all this was, yeah, well, remote working's great. How many are we left of the senior management that actually live and work in West Berkshire? And how does that filter down through our staff? So, because if you live and work in West Berkshire, uh, you earn your money and you spend your money. And so we, we get a kickback. Um, or are we entering a scenario where the residents of West Berkshire pay the, the wages of, of all the staff, but none of them actually live or work here anymore, and therefore the money just flows out of the district? So that they, they, you can see, I'm not, I'm not, there are concerns. I'm sure there are answers that can be brought forward, but it's why I think there are, there's more work to do in this Time Lord 2 uh, project. Thank you, Councillor Grabs. Um, firstly, just to put it in perspective, this is by far the largest of the three buildings, making up about two thirds of the total. So whilst there is some impact, it's not as if it's two thirds closing down. Um, did anyone want to ask about the percentage in the office? Um, and forgive me, I can't remember exactly what you, your question was, uh, whether it was going to be 20%, 30%, 40%, I think it was. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, the, the, the move, what, what are we anticipating the percentage of time our, our officers well, are well, going to spend at home? Um, Apple are looking at about two-fifths. Yeah. You know, they, they basically, you must come in three days a week and you can work a couple of days from home. Where are we, three-fifths? It's in the paper. It's in the paper, in... Councillor Abs, if you've read it, the paper. OK, thank you very much. You don't, you don't know that. I would just add, it, that's part of the reason for the additional consultant consultation with the staff, because we were concerned there wasn't being... Uh, affected by the COVID issue. We want to make people think of where they're going to be post-COVID. Yeah. So, and so what about the, the, um, the effect on the town in terms of an actual number? Difficult to answer because until we haven't, until we finish the consultation, we won't know. But you look to get a number for us. So we, so yeah, we but it will take some time to give it to you. And it's not something I can totally answer in the next few days. Uh, and finally, on your point about whether people actually living in West Berkshire, the only thing I can tell you is our new chief executive officer has agreed he's going to move to West Berkshire. Councillor McKinnon. Yeah, thanks, Lydia. Um, thanks, Councillor Abs. You sort of brought my name into it, as you seem to be wont to do these days. Um, in, in terms of savings, we know how much money we spend in the buildings. We know what capital financing costs we've got allocated towards the building. So there is a certainty there about those savings. And I would just point out, there's maybe a wee inconsistency. We sat and listened to your very considered contribution on the Environment Strategy Delivery Plan. And it's something we've heard from you before, that you don't want wishy-washy wording. You want clarity. We want the highest standards. We don't want this vague stuff. And yet now you're telling us our numbers are too clear. I just wonder, which is it? Pick one. Pick a uh, well, it's appropriate to the number we're talking about. And this, this number is a, a definite, and it isn't a definite. So you can't make it a definite. <laughs> Okay, can we move on now, please? Um, can we go to Councillor Vickers? Yeah, thank you, Lydia. I mean, it, it's really it's the same point, the impact on the town, but a slightly different slant on it. Um, you know, reading reading the press and, and my social media, 
it may be that it's an unrepresentative sample, but a lot of people are worried about the impact that all these changes are having on the town. And, you know, we are the leaders of our community as the, as the, the district council. And it, it will be sending a message. I mean, Councillor Abbs put it, you know, West Berkshire is leaving West Berkshire. It's not like that. West Berkshire is leaving Newbury. And I feel, speak on this as somebody who lives five minutes walk from where most of you are all sitting. But I do think we've got to present this, although this is very much an internal focused matter, I do think we've got to present this as, as, a, as a somehow as a, as a good story. Yeah, and maybe the environmental positive is good, but the negative on the impact on the town and whether you're a property owner or an occupier or other residents who are fearing that more of your familiar retail outlets are going to close, this council is adding to that problem. And we've got to somehow turn that into a positive. And finally, you know, wearing my planning portfolio shadow hat, are we more certain now a year on from when, you know, the first wave of COVID was that this is the way to the future? Or is there a risk that we're, we're joining a sort of flood of lemmings that will be all flooding back or dropping over a cliff? You know, is this the future? I know one or two of my colleagues think, that, oh, no, we're going to come back to normal. It's all, a, it's all a blip. I'm not of that sort. But I think we've got to show leadership in the sense that we believe this is the right way and it is going to stay. And then people can plan. Thank you, Councillor Vickers. Um, again, I come back, the reason we're doing some further cons consultation with the staff is to try and get a better grip on that. Um, my own view is that probably half will be in any one time. It's just a finger in the air exercise, I'm afraid. Uh, Councillor Pattenton. Thank you, Lena. Yeah, just thinking about the the number of staff that would be here at any one time, Councillor Williston. In section 8.11, it states that the maximum desk capacity at Market Street is 581, and that potentially there could be, well, there's a requirement for 567 desks uh, where 569 are, would be allocated. So it strikes me that, you know, even though the, uh, the the objectives of of Time Lord Two are are uh, well intentioned, you know, it, it would put the council in quite a, you know, we'd be right up to the maximum essentially. Um, I wondered what contingency had been considered, or if, you know, whether that had been considered at this point. Yes, yes, that's exactly the reason why we decided we needed to hold on to the other two buildings for a while until things have bottomed out, and we would know whether we actually do need extra space or not. Thank you both. Um, Councillor Masters. Thank you, Leader. Um, Councillor Wollaston, um, could you um, clarify um, what status the employee survey has? If uh, employees are to fill that in, is that just to get their views and um, you know their intentions, etc., and it is not necessarily an acceptance of Time Lord 2 and also secondly what implications does this have on contracts with individual employees um, in terms of change of conditions and working hours etc um, um, and just as an, an aside when do the um, is it expected that the Unison's temporary exclusion from the um, uh, joint consultative panel will be uh, addressed and they will be back in those meetings, with, um, which I think is, as the Unison is one of the largest unions in the uh, council, I think there's some urgency and some, uh, you know, a very great need that they are uh, um, in the room for such meetings and consultation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, when we did the initial consultation, the vast majority of staff were keen to look at or follow the, the time lord approach of more flexible working. Um, in terms of Unison, I'm afraid that's not something I can comment on. I'm sure that's others might be able to, but uh, I'm not involved in that side of it. Um, and I'm, forgive me, your other question was? 
the impact on, on individual contracts oh, good. Um, and so the, the advice from, working conditions. The advice from the, uh, uh, the our legal team is that the contracts are not being affected. Thank you all, and thank you for taking part. Thank you. thank you for taking part in the debate, Councillor Dillon. You've had an opportunity to speak, and I'm actually going to call it there. I think we've had a really good, interesting discussion, and actually, the level of the discussion tells you that this is a hot topic. It's a topic that is happening up and down the country. Everybody's having it. I've seen Councillor Brooks go very red and speak very fast about this, um, so I understand that people are having these debates at the moment. Um, and uh, Councillor Vickers, you said to us about we need. To show leadership and I think you're absolutely right we do need to show leadership and one of the things I think has come out more and more is that we need to find a workable hybrid model uh, when we first started with COVID and we surveyed our staff back in last summer, there was a real love of working from home. However, the reality of working from home and the impacts on people's social, mental health um, that has really bit in and we recognise that not everybody works from home. If I was sat here tonight telling everybody that the process going forward was to get everybody back into the office, I'm sure we would have an absolute uproar on our hands as well. So actually, when you talk about what other local authorities are doing up and down the country, Councillor Dillon, you'll be able to agree with me on this one. We've heard from other chief executives, they are doing exactly the same as what we are doing. They're being proactive and they're trying to ensure that their staff have that flexibility, which is really what Time Lord 2 is about. It's about that flexibility and about that certainty that you mentioned, Councillor Vickers, because staff need to know what's happening in the future. We can't just pause while we wait for new interim arrangements to come into place or a new CEO to come into place. We're on a roadmap. Um, it changes on the 19th of July. Uh, we know that the guidance is changing all the time and we need to be proactive in making sure that our staff feel comfortable with what is happening and making sure they're aware of that. Um, there was a few points I just wanted to come back on and I suppose I've had the privilege of being in West Street over the last 18 months, a lot of that nobody else has done because I've actually been needed in for certain things and I've had the opportunity to speak directly to staff about how they feel about this and I've heard, you know, a real desire for that flexible opportunity that we're proposing here in Time Lord 2. Um, you, you, you ask a very valid point about services and how are they supporting our residents but actually COVID has enabled us to support our residents in ways we never actually thought. I would highlight our library service to you all so if you want an example Councillor Dillon the library service no no but but, but, but that you asked for examples you, you asked for examples, I'm giving you, and if you may, I let you speak. Um, I asked for examples, and I would say a, a prime example of how um, that virtual working has helped has been with our residents throughout the COVID period from our library service. So their whole online service and how they've brought story time to children um, who are uh, having to stay at home, how they've enabled reading book clubs to go forward, how they've enabled click and collect has been a real example of how we can actually make this work for residents. However, I do take your point about the report where it doesn't show the residents voice enough and I accept that and this is one of the things going forward as a local authority we really need to make sure we're, we're having into these conversations so I do accept that particular point. Um, the, the, the other one that we talked about is Newbury Town Centre, um, and I'm really pleased that, again, we've put in place plans to look at the futures of town centres. Town centres were changing pre-COVID. We know that. Um, we, we worked on that proactively to make sure we've got a master plan. And actually, they're still changing because we won't be the only offices with less staff coming in. So they've got to look at that from the master plan point of view. There isn't a perfect solution. We're trying to get that hybrid model where we'll still have staff coming in, even if you look at the, um, the, the home working style um, and it's, it's detailed in there. The recommendation is around, I think it's two days per week, but they don't have to be taken one week. So we're still going to get that, that flow and ebb of staff coming into the centre of Newby. And we're, we're really conscious about how we support our high streets. But high streets, whatever way you look at this, are changing. Uh, and that's why we're doing the current Newby Town Centre Master Plan. So I don't think every we have all the perfect answers at this point. Um, I'm really pleased that we're going out to staff and we're asking them about what work work style they, were, they would like to do. I'm really pleased that we're doing it on that six month basis to see again. Um, we don't know the future. Um, we're, we're talking about what might happen this winter, uh, what will happen with regards to COVID. But for me, 
see this is the right step. This is being proactive. This is showing leadership. And this has taken us in the direction of travel that I think ultimately every organisation around the country is having. So I'm very happy to second this report, Councillor Wollaston, uh, and I would um, support the recommendations as laid out. And I would ask members of the executive to do so too. Thank you. back to me again sorry uh, therefore we we've had a good discussion um and there is uh, recommendations laid out in front of you and they're recommendations 2.1 through to 2.6 um i would like um, the executive members to vote by raising their actual hand if they're in favor of the proposals um to uh, if they're in favor of the proposal to approve the recommendations before you this evening Thank you, Leader. I can confirm that that has been approved. Thank you, Sarah. Can we move on then to item nine? And I believe, Councillor Ardwater, that you would like to introduce this report. Um, does that find a seconder? Thank you, Leader. Yes, I am very happy to present this report. And I'm happy to second it if I could get my microphone to turn on, Leader. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Bridgman, that was me. <laughs> um, OK, over to you, Councillor Arderwater. Um, thank you, Leader. Um, so as all members will be sadly aware, there was uh, an awful incident uh, this March involving the loss of life of a, of a young child. And uh, following that uh, awful incident, uh, officers from this council met together with the Canal and River Trust, who own and manage and are responsible for a huge proportion of our district's uh, waterways and with the emergency services uh, to look at how best we can and should respond to that. And as a result of uh, meetings uh, since March, uh, there is now a proposal to establish a water safety partnership for this district, uh, which will focus on communicating and uh, highlighting to residents the risks of water, um, promote uh, public awareness and share best practices both uh, within the area and more widely across the country. Um, this approach of a, a cross-agency uh, partnership has been shown to work successfully in other parts of the country, as, as you will see in uh, as, as detailed in, in paragraph 5.7. Um, so at this stage, uh, this report uh, seeks our approval to be a lead member of this partnership. Um, more details will be uh, developed over the coming months. Um, personally, uh, members, I, I think this has, has got to be uh, the right way ahead. Uh, we have a, a significant responsibility here, along with the Canal and River Trust in particular, uh, to look at how best to respond and to minimise these uh, risks and, and awful incidents such as this going forward. And so I, I do commend this report to you. Thank you. Members of the executive, any questions for Councillor Arderwater? Um, Councillor Dillon. Yeah, thank you, Leader. We're um, in, in full support of this body being informed. Um, uh, I won't, won't elaborate any further. I think mean, Councillor Arderwater has, has um, uh, outlined the reasons for it. Um, just on page 192, uh, Councillor Arderwater, there's a, just a small error. Um, it's about sharing of information. It says all minutes and information regarding the group will be publicly accessible through the web page, which is located at West Bart's question mark, question mark, hosted by WBC. So I suspect it just needs its home page created, doesn't it? Thank you, Councillor Dillon. Uh, I'm sure that will be addressed. I have no other hands, Councillor Bridgman. Thank you, Leader. Um, I would simply. Um, I'll, I'll pick up the terms of reference point in a moment, but I would comment that the statement at 7.3 that one drowning is one too many is an understatement if ever there was one. Uh, and uh, I fully support the formation of this body uh, and look forward to, doing, to it doing some good work. Um, on the terms of reference point, I would simply say that terms of reference are a flexible beast, as I know only too well and we'll see in health and well-being some terms of reference coming forward um so uh, they, they can always be worked on and i'm but i think the spirit is is the important thing here and i fully support the proposal 
Uh, thank you all. Um, the recommendation is that the executive approves the council's partnership as a leading member. Um, it's laid out before you. Can I see a show of hands from executive members in favour of the proposal as set out? Thank you, Leader. I can confirm that that has been approved. Thank you all. Um, that concludes the main business of this evening's um, meeting. We'll now move to... I wasn't going to forget you, Councillor Diller. We'll now move to item 10, which is members' questions. Um, I'd like to thank those members um, that have submitted questions for this evening's executive meeting. Please note that in accordance with the new processes, you will not need to say, I ask the question standing in my name. Your question will appear on screen and will be answered by the relevant portfolio holder. You will then be given the opportunity to ask a supplementary question, but please remember that this must be to clarify the response provided and not introduce any new business. In accordance with paragraph 5.12.9 of the constitution, where questioners have more than one question, only their first question will be answered. If after all other questions have been asked and answered and there is sufficient time, we will answer subsequent questions. Please note that the time limit for members' questions is restricted to 60 minutes. And if your questions have not been answered in that time, you will receive a written response within five clear working days. The response given either verbally at the meeting or in writing will be published on the council's website. As Councillor Richard Sumner, the portfolio holder for planning and transport has given his apologies to this meeting. Questions put to him will receive a written response. There are questions, um, these are questions A from Councillor Barnett and F from Councillor Cotton. Um, I therefore would like to invite Councillor Dominic Bowick to answer um, Councillor Martha Vickers question B on the agenda. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Vickers. Um, you, you've asked a, a very, very um, apposite question, and I'm really pleased to be able to respond to it. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I, I was going to uh, uh, give you a, a, a long and detailed and a, a comprehensive reply to your question um, about what we are doing to ensure uh, and, and to address the, uh, the emotional well-being and mental health um, of our uh, children and young people in these difficult times. It's, it would have been the sort of question that I know Councillor Dillon is particularly keen to hear from me. Um, uh, before I go on, I'd, I'd just like to point out that um, the, 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 this, it is the CCG that is responsible for the delivery of, of CAMS, of the services that CAMS provide. Um, our role, of course, is to, uh, uh, um, is to ensure that our young people get the best that, uh, that they can. So we're very interested in, uh, in the delivery of the service. Um, Councillor uh, 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 Doherty mentioned earlier on that we attended a meeting uh, um, with, recently with our head teachers that was intended to um, find out from them what they needed what they need um, in terms of recovery. And um, I, I think the, the, uh, the initial um, direction of that meeting was to find out from head teachers um, how the children can be supported in, um, in recovering the time that they've lost. It became very clear um, that, 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 uh, um, that our, young, our young children need more than that. And um, a, a, a phrase that stuck with me um, uh, that I've taken away from that meeting. One of our head teachers said, we've all heard about long COVID, but we're facing long recovery. And what, uh, what she was saying in essence is, we really don't yet know what the scale of the problem is that we're dealing with. It was a really interesting meeting. And thank you for inviting me, um, leader, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as the leader. I said there were three head teachers, officers, and um, Laura Farris, MP, was there. And she was particularly interested in uh, our, our conversations. Um, so it, it's, it's, become, it's becoming very clear um, that the challenges that we're facing are not really the challenges that, 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 that have been uh, um, described in the report that Councillor Vickers um, referred to. Um, that, that report was based on data pre-COVID and things have changed very much um, uh, since that time and, and in unexpected ways. So for example, um, some of our most disadvantaged children have done very well 
in lockdown, which was a surprise to me. Um, that's because they were able to go to school and they were they, they had much closer attention while they were in school during the so certainly that's true of the second and third lockdown. It wasn't so, so much so true in the first lockdown because there was all sorts of uncertainty, anxiety, and so on. And then um, so, so our PPG children did better. Oh, I have to be very careful here about talking in broad brush terms. This is true of some of the children. Um, and then equally, some of, the ch some of our children uh, um, who uh, uh, one would have expected would have dealt very well uh, and thrived very well in lockdown. Um, our, let's say our, some of the people who have the advantages that, that our PPG people, people, uh, ch uh, pupils, children don't have, um, some of them did poorly. Um, there were cases, that, uh, and that's down to the fact that um, um, anxiety at home has built. Um, people have they've either, they've either been furloughed or worse, they've lost their jobs. Um, and so, so some of those people have not done as well. Um, and, and, and in overall terms though, of course, ev for everybody, circumstances have changed really dramatically. And we, uh, I think that the effect of the pandemic on our children and young people, people is still emerging. So we want, what we need to do going forward is work closely with our partners. Um, that is our schools, uh, the CCG, all the partners are involved that, that, that in supporting our children and young people. Listen to schools and young people and continue to build on um, what we already provide, which are the tier one and tier two services that we provide here in West Berkshire. And, and uh, tier one, uh, as an example, is the, the excellent Cooth service that uh, children can access without being referred to, uh, without being referred, can access anonymously. And, uh, um, and, and uh, the, the take up for that has been excellent. Uh, tier two services are, are Emotional Health uh, Academy, um, and, and, and this, the, the, the two um, mental health support teams that we now have, we have one, and we've recently um, been granted um, uh, uh, um, funding to, to, to have a, to, uh, for a second team. Um, and last of all, we need to work closely with our CCG to make sure that, um, that, that they improve the tier three um, services, which of course include CAMS. So if um, Councillor Vickers is, is happy with that response, then, that, then I will send to her the detailed one um, that I was going to read out uh, um, so she can, have, she can, she can uh, look at a different perspective. Uh, but, but if uh, Councillor Vickers has a supplementary, I'll happily answer it. That was the short question. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Bjork, and, and thank you for showing um, your concern and for acknowledging that this is a crucially important issue. It's all about the future of our children and for also acknowledging that it's something that we've become aware of during and post COVID and the situation is now worse than it was. So it's crucial. Um, and yes, thank you for pointing out that this is really a CCG matter, but that the council works in partnership with the CCG which is the point of my question, that the council has a strong influence and a, a responsibility to highlight these issues through the experience that it show is, is coming through in our schools. Um, so, so many supplementaries I could have, and I'm waiting for you to shut me up. <laughs> but you're not, thank you for not shutting me up. Um, so if you don't what I would, what I, my supplementary would really be that um, acknowledging that this is, obviously it's a CCG matter, um, would you acknowledge that when young people get to the stage where they're being referred to PAMS, that this is the most severe level of, um, of care and that it's crucial that they're seen as soon as possible? Because we're talking at children at risk of suicide here. And would you agree that this is probably an issue that needs um, consideration by our health scrutiny committee? Um, I'm not sure I hold an opinion on that. Uh, um, I will send to you, Councillor Vickers, what we're already doing uh, um, uh, uh, in, in, in partnership with the uh, CCG. 
and I, I, I think we should, I think any services that we offer uh, um, benefit from um, scrutiny. Um, but I don't think that we I don't think that that health scrutiny would necessarily add anything uh, um, transformative at this stage. Um. Thank you both. I actually let that debate go on deliberately because I don't think anyone can underestimate the concerns that we have around our children's mental health. And I think we'd all be unanimous around that. So I, I deliberately let that debate go on. And, and Councillor Vickers, I'm very happy that you raised Thank it. You. With, Thank regards, you very much. With regards to CAMS, um, we have to also recognise that it has many strands of its service, Councillor Vickers. I know that they, they deal with suicide prevention and working with children at that breaking point, but they also deal with lots of different children. And yes, I think it's course. worthwhile pointing out that there's different pathways into CAMS and that they have different responses. So I know the autism pathway quite well and I know there's a huge waiting list for it but support is available while you are on that waiting list so I just I just felt it was worthwhile sure. putting that but it's certainly something that I think I've got the chair of health and well-being board waving his fingers at me yeah. um, but but I think it's a really important issue uh, that certainly health and well-being board will continue to be working with our partners on so thank you for raising it thank I'm you. gonna let him come in um, thank you, Lita. I, I, I was simply going to make the point that really it is definitely not for the executive to tell either of the scrutiny commission or committee to, as to what they should be scrutinising. Uh, and I think we, we do well to stay completely out of that conversation. I, I invite you to talk to the chair of the Health Scrutiny Committee on that subject. Thank you. Now, Councillor Dillon, I'm not going to let the next one go on so long. <laughs> So I believe the next one on my list is um, to from Councillor Dillon. Question C from Councillor Dillon to Councillor Cole. Okay, sorry, can I just declare an interest that my my so I, I tabled this question as an emergency and it was about pubs really, um, but my father is a, a, a major shareholder in one within West Berkshire, so I should declare that as an interest. Apologies. Thank you for that interest. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Councillor Dillon. I can't guarantee to the leader that this will be any less of a lengthy response uh, because you asked a really interesting question. Uh, and as you said, uh, you, you've just alluded to, um, my understanding is that it's arisen as a result of a query from a landlord who is trying to work out if they need to follow the requirements of their licence and therefore keep doors and windows closed to limit the potential for noise emanating from the premise, or if they need need to ensure that the premise is well, is well ventilated to minimise the risk to customers and staff due to COVID-19, which we know to be transmissible through airborne particles. The closure of windows and doors to reduce noise from a licensed premise is not a speci specific requirement in the Council's licensing policy. The policy recommends that the op operating schedule addresses detailed activities depending on the nature of the event and the premises concerned, which includes the prevention of disturbance uh, to neighbouring residents by patrons arriving at or leaving licensed premises through noise or light pollution. The policy also states that when issuing a licence, stricter noise control conditions are likely to be imposed on premises in residential areas. As members will know, uh, prevention of public nuisance and public safety are both licensing objectives laid down in the Licensing Act of 2003. It's not possible, nor would it be right, to take a blanket approach to all premises, as each will have its own individual circumstances to take into consideration. If there's a specific condition attached to a licence requiring windows and doors to be closed, the landlord can submit an application to vary their licence should they feel the need to do so. The impl implications of a COVID pandemic are unlikely to have been factored in when these conditions were set. And you'll be aware that it is the responsibility of the landlord to ensure that their staff and patrons act in accordance with any conditions attached to a, li attached to a license. Uh, and finally, the council appreciates that the conditions on some applications will contradict with a guidance issued in relation to ventilation of premises due to the COVID pandemic, where 
uh, and where possible, a pragmatic approach will be adopted. It should, however, be noted that residents living in close proximity to a premise will have become accustomed to quieter times and any noise may seem more pronounced to them. As we have done throughout the pandemic, we will seek to strike the right balance between the various protective measures. Do you have a supplementary? Yeah, well, well um, thank you for the answer. And it was, um, I appreciate it's a highly legislated area um, in which the question is, is looking at. Um, but it was about giving um, our local businesses the best chance of of, of, of having a good summer to recover. Um, the urgency was in relation to the football final, um, but but with our sorrow there, or, or Councillor McKinnon's <laughs> glee, um, obviously we, we, we will become one in a few weeks time when we cheer on the Olympics. So uh, there is another chance for, for uh, patrons to go to pubs. I was right um, behind I England, Councillor Dillon. <laughs> I, missed I was right behind England all the week, Councillor Dillon. Good, good. Um, or well, even in the group game. <laughs> um, so I think the pragmatic approach that you said is the bit that we need to hold on to um, and obviously for, for landlords to look at their licences and, and know that you will uh, uh, review them. So my supplementary is, um, is there an expediated process for you to be able to review any um, relaxation that a licensee might wish to undertake? Uh, to answer your questions, uh, Councillor Dillon, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, so I will find out the answer and I'll get trading standards to drop you uh, a written uh, email in response to that. But I, I can only say uh, praise our trading standards, uh, uh, Public Protection Service, for the pragmatic and uh, sympathetic approach that they've taken to all businesses throughout this pandemic. And it, they are to be congratulated on, uh, on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hilary. Um, I concur. Thank you both. Um, can we move on then to question D on the agenda, which is Councillor Masters to Councillor McKinnon. Uh, yeah, thanks, Leader. Um, West Branch Council owns uh, 75 residential properties at the present time. Uh, do you have a supplementary, Councillor Masters? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Can we move on then to question E, which is Councillor Masters to Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Masters. Uh, there are no people in West Berkshire owned properties on an emergency basis. Do you have a supplementary? So um, there's so no families are in um, on short term emergency um, tendencies. There aren't any emergency tenancies. As I've said, there are no people in West Berkshire own properties on an emergency basis. OK, thank you very much, Councillor Cole. Thank you both. Um, members, uh, that con um, concludes the business for this evening. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for their attendance, both virtually and here in the chamber. Uh, I'm, I'm going to close the meeting, but I'd just like to remind all members to stay in their seats until we're, we're told that live streaming has stopped. So thank you very much for your attendance this evening, and we'll look forward to seeing you all again soon.